Um, thanks a lot. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks a lot for inviting me and having the chance to talk here. I will now talk much more out of the practice of an urban planner um, and quickly introduce myself. I'm trained as an uh, interior designer, beginning of carpenter, and then an uh, architect, and then I went into urban design. And at the moment, I'm uh, running a KCAP, Case Christians' office in Zurich, dealing between the two scales of architecture and urban design, and also big scale and uh, small scale urban design. And I will um, focus on two themes we kind of, we work a lot with between these different scales, on one hand the open city and also infrastructure and mobility accessibility within city planning, um, plus placemaking, let's say, on a level that is much more about architecture, the space in between buildings and what do we need, let's say, in our everyday surroundings. Um, and I will show three projects um, where infrastructure, mobility, um, accessibility, but really also infrastructure projects have a certain impact. One, let's say, as a kind of motor of urban development, um, then let's say that mobility really ha can, can also cause a lot of problems within an urban planning, let's say, within, within urban development, and how to deal with that. And one project from Asia, a really huge one, where also infrastructure lines, uh, like mentioned on your brief and this nice poster you got, can also cause segregation and also really kind of build barriers between different kind of urban developments and how to, let's say, overcome this and integrate this kind of as a, or let's say, transform it into a kind of connector between different kind of city areas. Um, I found this image, let's say, of a huge infrastructure here in, in Stockholm. I have to admit, I really nearly don't know the city. What I saw till now looks really very nice, but I didn't saw the outskirts and also the problems, let's say, you deal with at the moment, kind of grow within this growing city. Um, and the huge map you have to deal now the next week with, I think it's really interesting because you really have, a lot of you have to focus on really inner city areas, but you also have to focus on, um, let's say, kind of outskirts and really regional areas. And I hope you will really see also that the context you're working within is really very important on uh, the answers you're, you're talking about. So I, I like to address two themes. One is the open city, that's where we're in really mobility and accessibility um, has an enormous impact. And the second is uh, this theme of placemating, starting with open city. You see here two images, city as a tree, and uh, the open city, and you see what the spatially wise means. So you have city as a tree means you have a lot of uh, really dead-end streets here. There's no accessibility from one part to the other. There's a certain social segregation by that, and this also can be caused by really huge infrastructures. They kind of cut off different bits and pieces of the city from each other. And there's, let's say, the problem of monofunctional program. I also heard you have to deal with, let's say, very often in the outskirts, where a lot of really, really just residential areas um, are, and there's not so many, so, so much program, mixed use program, and also not so many services. Let's say where we like to go to all the time and focus on it is really go into the open city, multi-directional um, accessibility, coexistence between the different kind of areas, and also a very diverse, um, vibrant, colorful city. So this is really the notion, let's say, where we kind of start all the time. Um, I like to address this on s um, one project we were I'm working uh, between 2008 and 2009, a long time, um, the legacy framework for London, for the reuse of uh, the integration of the Olympic venues um, back into the city fabric. They used it really as a kind of generator for urban development, the games, which we're going to start now. So there are five spatial aspects about this concept. So on one hand, what you see already here, the different, the different characters that we really focus on, different kind of character areas in, and also try to um, um, really um, improve this kind of different addresses and characters, identities within the city. So the maximal integration is very specific for this program of the Olympic investments and venues. A maximization um, of connectivity and uh, um, accessibility of the different areas, promoting sustainable lifestyle and using this urban mosaic, let's say this kind of colorful, different kind of identities for uh, um, as a as a base for urban planning. Um, what you see here is, let's say, the, the improvement of accessibility within this kind of period of time. So you really, can see an enormous. Um, increase of connectivity lines within this kind of um, area, the southern, the, the, the lower east dwelling, um, which has then, um, let's say, really an important impact on the vibrancy and also, you see here, um, let's say, how we try to knit these things together. 
and here over the Lower East well, uh, um, Valley kind of as a park to really connect with a lot of different um, mobility modes, transport uh, lines, um, the accessibility and knitting back um, integration of this area into the city. So that really this kind of new urban fabric can appear with different identities within this kind of um, next to an ex this existing um, not node of Stratford Village. And the idea is really to get to this kind of colorful and very um, very characteristic area so that all the time also um, Ole, um, uh, Ole Jensen was talking about um, the definition of places, let's say that you really define specific places within this fabric um, to create certain identities and neighborhoods people like to live in next to each other. An enormous impact on that has a public transportation network which was there already, already existing. So if we are in this kind of metropolitan, really denser areas, you really need a certain amount of, um, a high amount of public uh, access, transport accessibility. What I heard now is that uh, there's also here in Stockholm, you talk about the uh, increase of individual transport. I'm afraid this will, will need, lead to a certain collapse at a certain point. I will mention this later on, uh, on, a, on an example of Zurich, how they deal with the situation. It's a very small city, but they have this kind of problematic that they cannot deal with the amount of individual transport they have within the city. So you see here that the accessible um, road network, which is really important, but you really have to kind of also define on which level the bigger, the, the bigger lanes are the, 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 the really drive-through areas, and then you kind of differentiate in other, in other levels so that you really have areas that are much more kind of calm and not so... Um, not so used or not so accessible by um, individual transport or it's difficult to get, more difficult to get there, you get there but it's not really um, so convenient. And an, an enormous, uh, what's really important is really kind of slow traffic network within this kind of area so that you really have a pedestrian and cycle network and this is the key accessibility within your neighborhood. Within this framework, this is a framework for development and we deal all the time, um, I will see, you will see this later on a little bit more in detail, kind of a hybrid frame, there's an open framework, so it's not kind of completely planned everything. So we kind of only plan certain aspects, especially let's say the accessibility, the road network, and within that you have development fields. They can be filled in, in relation to a rule set we kind of define, but this, this is a kind of robust and flexible framework that can adapt to, diff to, the, to the change of external parameters. So, for instance, if you have, uh, we're dealing in a lot of other countries, now in the Netherlands, for instance, with this econ economical crisis. So we're talking now about shrinking, so the political, economical, but also sociological kind of changes an urban plan has to be able to deal with. So it's not a fixed kind of planning from top. You plan only just, let's say, what's necessary to be planned and the rest you keep as much as possible flexible that the city can really grow and develop. This is a possible exemplary layout within this thing, so it can really also grow in different kind of ways. And an overview of how this could look like. And now quickly how this really can grow. But let's say, if you see, there could be also another possible infill so it's really, they say, these high points can, could also appear on a, on, 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 a com, on a different spot. This is really kind of um, mainly be glad, try to keep this flexible. Next issue, next theme I'd like to focus on is place making. Again, on this kind of um, um, example of London, you see a lot of different kind of um, areas and uh, colorful, uh, um, I, let's say, identities. This will be the, is the development, let's say, there the Olympics took part. So it's a complete, it's really a, a new spot in the city and a kind of extension of the city, city framework. And within that, we really try to focus on different character areas. So the, the different colors show really different identities so that you have a kind of um, neighborhood that you really feel for Will Miljavis, let's say. Berlin is a very good example of this kind of called Keats. So a lot of different villages, let's say, form this kind of city. And interesting enough, people living in Berlin, they kind of not so often go out of their kids. So they st stay in their area because they have everything they need for their everyday life in that. And that's the, that, that's the focus, let's say, try to, to deal with kind of you really, um, to try to define areas where you can work, you can live, you have your service, you have the school, etc. So you don't need necessarily to commute. 
for sure people will commute, but you provide, let's say, the maximum possibility that people can, st can stay in their area. That's something a bit weird now. So placemaking um, quickly, as a term, began to be used in the 1970s, creating squares, plazas, parks, streets, waterfronts, whatever. Um, what, what's interesting is, someone mentioned here enough, let's say we have to deal with a lot of um, theories, specialism, regulations, exhortations, demonstration projects. We have as planners um, kind of, we're so focused on certain issues that we, um, I think, and also mentioned here by Bernard Dunt, um, that we really lost a little bit, simply lost the art of placemaking, or let's say, let's call it differently, that we have lost the simple art of placemaking. How to really make a place and what really kind of needs, what, what are, the, what are the, the, the parameters you need to define a place. So here, for instance, one image is the real sense of a place. Or oh, is this the real sense of a place? Um, here, quite empty, question mark. This is an example <coughs> in Oldham. So there is no kind of activated um, grade level. So there's no life, let's say, on this kind of things. This is the... This is one container where this kind of happens. Um, this is a place within this container. Um, this is another one, but completely different um, area. This is another container, let's say the example of Asia, Shanghai, wherein this is a very vibrant and uh, um, an inhabited kind of used um, place. This is another one, another one with in completely different conditions. Um, and the question is really, can we make, let's say, really make places, can we really define them, and um, should they not be a result rather than an input? And what can we do to really, um, to really create, let's say, these possibilities? And um, we heard earlier also that temporary uses um, are, let's say, a, a motor to create places, to really um, pro um, proactively, let's say, um, develop a certain sense of a place and also a perception of people of a place, and then afterwards, that's the gentrification process starts. And how do we do that? It's a rebuilt history in several ways. Or do, do we have to build modern? This is the, an image of the line line in Notre Dame, a very, let's say, the first pedestrian area. Um, a lot of commercial spaces, but during the night time, say because there is a certain lack of residential space around, it's quite empty. Um, another, another example from Rotterdam, what are the most, the most important elements to define a place? And I'd like to address here five um, points. Say on one hand, what's really important, let's say, within urban planning, and we very often focus also on our, our um, presentations then really on the great level, that is really the ground floor, and what happens on the ground floor. So if the ground floor is active, it's not so important what's happening above, so to say, and that's also the first perspective you have as a person moving and, uh, and, and walking through a city. This is two is, um, the question is really achieving a fine grain um, on this ground, let's say a different mix of program, but also um, really nice, um, public space so that people really can walk in secure, but also have lots of possibilities to sit, to stay. Um, you see another example over here. Um, again, um, this, uh, uh, the line one in Rotterdam. But another point is also the adaptili adaptili uh, adaptility of these places, that, that people really can use it, they can kind of change it, they kind of use it in certain different ways. Like you see here, for instance, of it's, it's a water, water play, but people just use it as a playground. It's not mentioned like, but they use it. Um, another example from the Schraubachplein in Rotterdam, where also people really inhabit it, perform on this kind of square. So defined spaces where people really can, to create niches, people really like to inhabit and uh, perform in. A fourth point is, uh, that it's, it's, let's say, that the sum of the aspects and kind of um, program around inner place when we define, define it. And build then this kind of vibrant areas and also places to go and define the character of a certain quarter neighborhood in a city. Um, you see here again this kind of image like we, um, for, for London um, to really define different kind of um, 
attractors within this urban fabric, people really can also tell it's my, na it's my neighborhood, it's my kind of um, heat, so to say. Um, talk, going back to, um, let's say, mobility infrastructure and also infrastructure developments, what, what kind of impact has infrastructure um, within a city fabric? You see here a kind of polycentric um, um, idea about city. Um, and I think a lot of, let's say, all devel city developments go in this direction. For instance, the airport or the center, which is not really 100% working, the center, but you can see it kind of have a certain impact on the development of a city, especially airports and also train stations um, are hubs where, where around, let's say, the city really develops in a very kind of automatic autopilot, on a, let's say, on an autopilot um, status way. Um, and next to that, there, there, there appear certain breeding grounds. What you can see, for instance, here um, at Schriphol Airport, you see in red um, the airport services and supplies, the terminals and all the kind of garage uh, spaces around. But what happens is that, is that uh, um, the whole city airport kind of, uh, we talk about nowadays airport cities, so there is kind of really um, pressure on the development around airports, but also other kind of infrastructural hubs, people come there, people meet there. Schiphol Airport has, at the moment or other airports function as a kind of city in itself. So you can live there, you have hotels, you have a kind of um, service supplies, you have uh, um, convention centers. So people just meet there because it's the most accessible place for, let's say, um, from different kind of cities within Europe, for instance, or also international, global. Um, that has a certain impact and a kind of um, automatic development around these kind of places. The same about city centers, but especially, let's say, um, um, station areas within the city center. You see here, uh, I focus now a little bit more on Switzerland, you see here the public transportation net of Switzerland. Um, and around the name of Zurich, this, this is the main, the, the, the main station, central station. Um, the, city, the city kind of develops like that around the lake. And Switzerland is very special in, let's say, in this kind of policy of public transportation. So um, you can, the public transportation system is perfect, so to say, you can get in each valley, let's say by bus, let's say you have, and each level of uh, public transportation mode is, even if it's a private company, you will buy on one point, let's say, or via your SBB, your, your, your app, or let's say the station, a ticket for all the kind of different uh, um, mobility supplies. And I think that's really important. So you have one address where you, where you get your ticket and then you kind of, whether it's a bus or it's a private company, whatever, it's all connected and it's one, let's say, company that provides, let's say, the, 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 the ticketing. Um, what they have is, let's say, within the city, um, it's very easy to get into the city by public transportation. It's incredibly difficult to get into the city by individual transportation. So we had, uh, for instance, we were dealing with this project. Let's say also, that's what, what I like to mention is this infrastructural project. It's a kind of drive-through, new drive-through possibility with a train. The central station is over. Oh, let's show it here. Is over here, and uh, at the, and it's a terminal, or it was a terminal. There's already a drive-through station. Um, they build a second one, but they need to build this huge infrastructure to really get, uh, let's say, the trains out of the, to bring the trains out of the city, to bring them to the north of Germany. Um, this is an ongoing uh, project at the moment, and because of this infrastructure project, um, the whole area around the station, um, you see here already this kind of building. See, this is a central station in the middle, and I see on the other side, um, let's say, this development area gets free. And it's, let's say, the best connected, the best connected spot in the whole country. Um, and will be, let's say, now developed into an inner city um, mixed use uh, area. It was the first project, you see here, one infill in the plan. It was the first project where we not had to build, let's say, discuss about parking places because we were just only allowed to build I don't know the number anymore, but it was a ridiculous number of parking places because this is the best spot um, accessible by public transport and you have to get there by public transport. So for all residential spaces, there will be no parking place at all. Um, and that's very, very special, let's say. In, I, for instance, I live now since 2006 in, in, in Zurich. 
I don't have a car because a car is really just only expensive. You don't find a parking place. You get everywhere by public transportation. You are, let's say, very quickly at the central station and the airport is connected um, with the central station by a train. You need about 15 minutes. So everything is kind of in a short, it's a small city, but still it's really an enormous kind of connectivity within the country and you don't need Let's say the car is more difficult. If I have to drive to, um, to a place within the city, you have to do, let's say, this kind of like this kind of flower, flower range. So you're much better. Um, you, you better take public transport or the bicycle, and you're much quicker. Say over there. What we did then here, just showing, let's say, this idea of an open framework. Um, we try to, let's say, integrate a certain density with within this kind of on this kind of spot. They, they were asking for an enormous density. Um, of 3.1, which is for Zurich really high. They have an average density of two. Um, and what you see here is just an envelope talking about this open framework. We really define from, let's say, this existing urban fabric, wherein, let's say, then buildings can appear um, in certain different um, levels. So what we said is uh, we defined a certain section also that you have this kind of average height of 18 meters with the existing height here is between uh, 17 and 20 meters so average 18 and um, from there kind of you have to tip back so high rise can appear but not kind of on this kind of direct edge of uh, the block a perimeter block so that as a kind of um, pedestrian you all the time see only this kind of um, existing city fabric and the density will appear then like you see here on top and on the perimeter block and tipped into the into the perimeter block. Um, what you see here, you see this kind of envelope uh, as a wireframe and a possible possible infill. But all these kind of infills are within this kind of framework possible. So you can discuss about a kind of this is let's say this kind of robust plan, what I, what I talked about in the beginning, that you just give a framework. The city fabric is still the same. So all the kind of all the kind of streets follow, let's say, the existing contextual grid, but how you fill this in, this will be kind of defined by the market and the de developers afterwards. We cannot do this, we can kind of, as a planner, cannot predict this in advance. Very often, this kind of plans need 20, 30, 40 years that they, um, have to, uh, that they, will, be de uh, they will develop. Um, the economical situation can change completely. Um, so they also have to be robust come to have to, to take um, an infill of office space, but also residential space. Okay, this went much, um, much quicker because it's, let's say, the filet piece in, in, within the city. So you see here already, let's say, how this look, look, will look like and uh, the first silhouettes appearing. Another um, project I like to... Um, show you is a master plan for Perm um, with a completely different aspect of uh, oh <laughs> to see it here. So this is Russia and so the problem there was kind of Russia is an enormous country and they have enormous space. So they don't, they don't have to take care um, of there is not a lack of space. So they kind of just spread, spread, spread. And the problem was then the result of this kind of development within the city um, was that they had they got an enormous problem of congestion and commuting, so they couldn't handle anymore. They say can people kind of um, moving into the city because they were so far living outside. Plus, you have this kind of um, effect that there is no really dense, vibrant, mixed-use urban life, but there are vast, vast areas of green wasteland, so to say, within the city center um, that make the city not attractive. So we were asked by. Um, the governor to really think about how can we kind of find a certain framework where, wherein, let's say, the city can develop um, in a more dense, let's say, um, way. Um, and what you see here is kind of several layers we were kind of um, dealing with. On one hand, the building mass, and we had to have to build public space network, street network, accessibility network, very important, but also a mixed-use concept. Because in Russia, there's very often, you have very often the situation, you have this monofunctional residential areas, they're completely, let's say, um, dead during the day and empty. Um, but you have, then there is no supply, there's, there are no services, there are no supplies, there's nothing, everybody has to get into the city. So really focusing on also there certain 
in itself autark functioning um, areas that people don't have, let's say, for all the kind of um, everyday things to commute, plus defining certain priority lines. Building mass was an enormous, um, let's say, big issue to deal with. We were kind of calculating this also block rules, etc. but I will not dive into that. And what we developed is then this kind of map where you see um, the darkest red um, areas are really the central zones where they should be densified. Um, the lighter it gets, the more suburban and then in a here with the purple and kind of pink and rose areas, you see developments, this kind of sprawl that already happened. And there we said they have to stay as a certain kind of in a village character, but not kind of start kind of focus, forcing the sprawl further. Um, you see also kind of green corridors into the city and they also started, let's say, to develop over there because they have the land. So they were thinking about um, building, building bridges and we convinced them to kind of really densify this area, build only in the areas they already developed, because there's already a university on the other side, but not kind of spreading out the city because they have not even, a, let's say, really structurally bridges at the moment. And if you, if you would densify this here, you need to have much more connection points over the river. Let's say we, have, we, did, we showed them, for instance, a comparison between London and Paris, and, for instance, Rotterdam with two bridges, and Rotterdam had uh, the problem, and Paris is really completely connected. Let's say you have a kind of range of bridges over the Seine, it's enormously. That's why it is working as a kind of concentric city. But here it would not somehow work, and these bridges will, would be the bottlenecks of transportation at a certain point, because the people, people need all the time have to go via this kind of bottlenecks um, into the existing city. What you see too is kind of a green corridors. They, not had, they didn't have really a kind of idea of this kind of nature. Nature has very nice valleys, these green corridors, but they used them as a kind of waste, uh, waste area. You could find their fridges, uh, laundry machines, whatever you can think about. Um, but they needed, let's say, as a kind of lung for um, fresh air and so, and, and so on to the city. So we really, def um, Defined that as a kind of all green is let's say no building zone, and that has to do, and I think that's also interesting to do. It's also to do with the kind of the cultural or the, the cultural background of the people there. So they, in, in in Russia, they not nobody takes really care of the public domain, because that was covered very long time by the state. Um, if you, if you go to to a Russian kind of not Moscow, that's really a special city, but the um, the let's say that the, where people take care of ends at their entrance door of the dwelling and the rest they think somebody else has to do. So these kind of aspects are all the time very important. Let's say if you work as an urban planner, go quickly through these rules. So this is really now this, the, the green um, public space network that goes also very often along um, with a, we try to all the time combine this with a street network. So you really have a um, public space Net network and green network that goes together with this mobility network um, to also provide their certain um, certain quality. Um, public transportation, long line, long lines and radials. You see now, let's say also the hierarchy, let's say of this mobility structure. Um, and then there is uh, on one hand the street structures of the city, but also very very um, very very dense and uh, covering nearly everything um, public uh, transportation network which is important to really can be, to be able to serve these sizes of cities. And then the mixed use, uh, the mixed use concept, so that you really have a certain centrality, um, and along the, the crucial radius, um, there is already existing program integrated, but in this kind of framework, in a, in a, in a most inner city framework, um, there are, let's say, this kind of um, mixed use areas, the purple ones, and only in the outskirts or, for instance, facing the river, really residential program. Um, and next to that, defining a certain um, idea of priority um, spots where the development should, where development should start, um, so that you really have a center point, but you create also sub-centers within this kind of network. So, and these should work as a kind of autark um, autark areas so that not everybody has to jump into the city. 
um, and this goes for sh in, in overlay with a mobility um, network. And you see here, let's say, the situation. Um, here, a lot of this kind of vocation houses. Here, there is a university, but what we said, and they really try to develop that kind of this area, and we said, densify within that and keep this as a natural recreation area for a long time, because you don't need to, because otherwise, you, like I already mentioned, get this kind of congestion problem over, you see how this kind of, what's within this area is still possible, let's say to densify the same, let's say for a western inner city part of the center, what's possible kind of to, within the urban fabric, um, so that there is a critical mass, after all, that creates certain places. And within these places, um, there's enough mass and density to define really um, a vibrant urban kind of public space um, people like to inhabit and people like to live in. Um, another, the last project I'd like to show is the uh, um, Creative Gateway in Shenzhen, where we had to deal with this, this inner city part. You see the site here. There's a big railway track over there, and there's a huge uh, um, traffic line over here. So there was no, no connectivity between these two parts, and there's a complete rupture also between these two parts of the city. So kind of the, the, the worst side of infrastructure, it really cuts off and segregates. And what does it need, let's say, to really transform this into a, um, to a gateway, so to say, a, a connector between the two parts? Here we also kind of approach kind of lively neighborhood uh, quality open spaces up to the same let's say the same aspects like I already talked before. What we did is really looking to decide what kind of typologies or morphology is existing, and it was quite um, poor, let's say, and also very monofunctional, like you see on this image. And then trying to develop here also a framework with different kind of tools. Um, green strategy and urban strategy and urban mosaic, really also, again, defining identi different identities, but also transportation. Um, and there was already, there was an existing, let's say, green belt, but through this kind of infrastructure is completely disconnected. Okay, not really, <laughs> not really visible. Um, and you see this kind of already existing kind of traffic line, this is the railway zone and trying to focus then on this connector and also building sub-centers within that kind of green belt to really um, provoke and, f um, and, and investigate this kind of connectivity between both sides. And you see this here, that's kind of revealing really the, the, the green qualities, the existing qualities connector here, um, another connection there and also uh, in a inner connection over here. Increasing, let's say, it's green, the green network that goes along with the mobility network. Um, integrating in that also water, the water system so that water is on one hand um, so kind of a, an additional attraction to the public space network, but it also works as a kind of sustainable system so to deal with uh, um, surface water, etc., within this kind of system. So it all the time has these two levels um, and not only aesthetic, aesthetic one. Um, you can see here. Um, this is then uh, the overlay of all the aspects in green network densify within this kind of um, uh, within this uh, um, already dense urban fabric, but in relation to and according to different kind of rules. So densify within the existing fabric, come keeping the street network and defining also secondary layer of connectivity between this kind of blocks, so that there are really kind of different hierarchies in the connectivity and also guidelines in, in relation to the rules, uh, uh, to the, to, in relation to the existing, so that you really frame with the building, with the building volume the streetscape, so you define already a certain orientation and not kind of putting um, buildings like uh, <coughs> bits and pieces, uh, like cake pieces on a plate, so they're not defining kind of um, um, orientation guidelines and spatial lines, and also not defining a certain inner and an out, uh, um, let's say differentiation between public, what you have here, you have clear differentiation between public and private space. This defines then all these new um, urban areas. And this is now under how we did understand, let's say, this kind of um, coming now to the, sorry, to the, to the um, mobility network. 
so this is the existing, the existing network and the rail track. Then we added a new kind of new inner connections within the area. Um, and then you see the kind of framework of different kind of um, levels of connectivity lines. So you have really express routes, they are already existing, you have then the major arterials. But you also, we also define a very fine mesh of different kind of um, um, mobility systems so that really the inner area is connected, uh, the, the, uh, the mobility is uh, certain and maximized. And this goes then together with a um, really slow traffic cyclists and a walkable um, area. So to define really areas in itself, they can work in an attack way. Public transportation network also connecting then over this gap. And let's say as one of the last, last levels in the parking network. And this is then, uh, let's say, within that, um, a kind of completely different kind of mesh than you saw in the beginning um, of the existing. And if we go now within this, this enormous area um, of mixed use, you see here, let's say, the existing mixed use, what we try to find, a bit fragmented in all this kind of bits and pieces. What we try to do is really defining also here certain character areas and in itself coherent um, um, quarters. They will be developed also with, like you see the icons, with different kind of typologies. So you really um, define certain kind of districts and neighborhoods, they work in itself and also have a certain border to the, to the neighbors. And define within that certain, let's say, really quality mixed use and uh, lively urban spaces on the grade level within this overall mosaic where we define this kind of color, dif in different colors, um, identities and characters. And let's say to define within this sheer enormous mass of uh, um, Asian development, really quality in spaces um, that really um, provide certain hand European kind of city qualities and uh, public space qualities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. I see some students leaving. All right. Well, now we have. To, let's say. Let's take a few questions, and then we're going to have a panel debate. We're going to set up a table here, and we'll have a discussion here. And I think it's it's worth staying, especially for the students. <laughs> okay. So let's take the first questions. Um, yeah, while discussing Perm, you just said that, um, or your actually one of the one of the pictures or one of the sheets said that the suburban shopping is a danger. And what do you think about Stockholm then, in that concerning that? No, I because think you had that. Yeah, the suburban shopping means that they really define shopping mall, big shopping malls in the outskirts. Yeah. Um, Let's say because that tears, let's say the the, the attraction, let's say from the city center. Yeah, I completely understand that, but it's it's like the same way around here in Stockholm, because every small city that's that's suburban has its own shopping mall, or almost every one of them. And is it or it's probably a general question to all of the guys here. Um, is it a problem in Stockholm? Because we are to develop some of the of the quarters of Stockholm, and is that a proper uh, way to develop the city here in Stockholm? I think if you have, let's say, it's not. I would not call it the, the draw it so black and white. Let's say if you have a neighborhood, you need certain daily supplies, and you need this kind of shopping mall. Um, it's more, but it should be in this kind of developments. Very often the problem is that these shopping malls are somewhere in the green, um, completely out of some settlement, so everybody's driving there. If this is in a settlement with a lot of um, residential space and other program around, no problem at all. Because you, pro you, you really kind of um, can get your everyday supplies 
in your neighborhood. It's more, I think this mentions more kind of really shopping malls, like in, I don't, I don't know the, the, the Stockholm situation, like in France, you drive, let's say, along a highway, and you have, you get everything, and you drive there once a week, and you buy your everyday supplies, and you, that's it. But this creates no urban life in the area. That's what we are talking about here. I think uh, these strategies you're proposing, they're pretty much exactly what uh, Jane Jacobs was saying in the 60s, almost. So you're right. What, what do you think, what, what has happened in the last 50 years that was not the same back then? Or do you think, is this like a universal solution to city life with a... I think this works, works pretty pretty everywhere, um, but we were discussing in, uh, previously also that there are certain issues of developers or also kind of um, economic-based firms, they kind of think about this differently. And it, that's these motors we really have to try to find, let's say, urban planning is also all the time, can, we can do a lot of plans if we don't have, let's say, the stakeholders and the kind of people next to us and they kind of also can convince them it's just a plan and it stays a plan. Is it different nowadays that politicians have the same, share this vision and have, think that the same strategies are efficient, like smaller blocks and ground yeah. floor activity and all these things? I think so, because let's say we kind of be dealing with a lot of this kind of um, problems, they came from other kind of certain developments. Let's say, we, for instance, we're dealing with a lot of greenfield campuses at the moment and they're somewhere outside of a city and really problematic. And now we have to reintegrate, let's say, to reactivate them, that they are kind of working in itself autark, they have all the day, they have supplies, they are, you can, you're able to live in, you kind of create a certain campus, campus living, working and living campus, instead of kind of pushing this somewhere outside and it's completely launching and people just go back and forth and at uh, and end of the day it's completely empty. And we have, for instance, these problems also in the Netherlands with a lot of these brain parks somewhere along a highway. You just have to cut them down because they're not working anymore. On one hand, they had, let's say it's clear now, let's say with the crisis, they're getting empty because these, these are the spots, they are not attractive anymore. And we have to get to a certain kind of um, urban fabric that we really kind of develop density around public transportation nodes and not somewhere where you can drive by car. Because I'm, I'm, let's say, what I heard before, let's say that there's still a kind of enormous investment in individual transportation here in the city. I think it should really get to the other side, kind of not investment in individual transport, but in public transportation and trying to really define urban city, so city areas, they kind of in itself, somehow, you go down to the center because you want to go to the theater, you, go, want to, you don't have everything, let's say, next to your house, but let's say your all daily supplies you have. And make it, make it more difficult, a lot of, like London, make it difficult to get into the city by, by, by it has to be, it has to hurt, I have to say, it has to hurt, it has to cost money, or it has to be pain in the ass to drive to the city, and then people really change. As long as I get a parking place, as long as I have a wide street, I try to take my car. And I'm, I'm the same, let's say, if Zurich would not be so difficult to drive in, I would also have a car because I, I would be much more flexible. But um, I need an hour to get rid of this car, so yeah, I don't take it. I don't have one, because it's just, uh, but it really has to hurt. And it has to, I think, let's say, I think hum, human nature is also a little bit like that, let's say, if we have then a certain problem or there is a collapse, then we start to think and then we start to kind of act. So it's not proactive, it's all the time. It's very often it's reaction on, let's say, a certain problem. 